thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. Okay, hugs and handshakes. You want to hug and handshake your neighbors? Okay, one more time. Here we go. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what? The Lord has done for us. Give thanks. Thank you. You may be seated. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone here today. 11 20 22. Today is World Children Day. That's a fact. I looked it up on the internet. World Children Day. A couple important announcements. Uh, first of all, in the back, I'll, I'll announce we have a, a donation box, and donations are thoroughly accepted here and, and much appreciative. Uh, there'll be no Bible studies this week, no Bible studies at uh, Jones, and no Bible studies at. You're going to have a Bible study, Pastor? Turkey Day. Turkey Day. We have Turkey Day this week. Uh, I'd just like to announce uh, a couple. We have our Christmas boxes, and I, I guess they're due today. There was a great turnout yesterday. Margaret, would you like to say something on that? Yes, ma'am. I don't know that the snow tires will fit in those boxes, but we'll do the best we can do. We'll sell the snow tires. Yeah, anybody want to buy a set of snow tires? <laughs> Vicky, all right. Uh, there again, in the next program we have coming up will be the Christmas program. If anybody feels like they have the spirit and they want to participate in that program, please see Joan here up front. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Ron and Teresa. It's always a blessing to look up and see these Floridians uh, visiting in northern Idaho. So they, they'll probably understand that next Sunday, uh, if we were in Florida, we, we would be having a pool party. <laughs> but we're not in Florida, so next Sunday after service here in our church, we're going to have a pew party. Uh, what that consists of is that we have to 
clear out this room. Everything on stage, everything out here has to be cleared out because they're going to start the carpet renovation on Monday morning. So any of the younger guys here that would like to participate in that, that would be much, much appreciative. And uh, at this point, yeah, for, for <laughs> people like me, I have to I have to ask the wife and you know see if she gives me my release to. <laughs> but keep that in mind. That's next Sunday after service. It's it's a big job, but with enough hands on deck, we can get that done. And I'm sorry, Doug, that was Navy term. I'm sorry, but uh, we'll get that we'll get that taken care of. Uh, we have also a special announcement. We have open enrollment for the next two weeks for our worship team. There's going to be some uh, changes here on the stage with the music, with the delivery of the song. So, again, if anybody feels it in their heart that they'd like to participate, uh, we have a whole lot of openings. And I'll leave that alone. Uh, I neglected to uh, entertain the fact. Is anybody first-time visitors here? We have a first-time visitor. Would you like to stand and tell us where you're from? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ron? Nebraska? Did I say it right? Nebraska? Wonderful. Thank you. In the pews in front of you, uh, there's a blue card if you so choose to fill out a name and address. We'll get some information to you. In the meantime, I'd like to welcome back my brother, Jay. How you doing, Jay? Welcome back. We'll continue with song this morning. We gather together. <laughs> we gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens his will to make known. The wicked obsession now cease from distressing. Sing praise to his name, he forgets not his own. Beside us to guide us, our God with us joining, ordaining, maintaining his kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the fly, we are winning. Thou, Lord, was on our side. All glory be thine. We all do exalt thee, thou leader triumphant, and pray that thou still our defender will be. Let thy congregation escape tribulation. Thy name be ever praised, O so Lord, make us free. Amen. We'll continue in song. Thank you, Lord. Some thank the Lord for friends and home for mercy sure and sweet. But I would praise him for his grace in prayer I would repeat. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me Thy great salvation, so rich and free. 
Some thank him for the flowers that grow, some for the stars that shine. My heart is filled with joy and praise because I know he's mine. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me my great salvation so rich and morning. <laughs> um, you know, just looking at God's word, um, in our Sunday school hour, we're going, Steve is leading us through the book of Ezekiel. And one of the things that I love about Ezekiel is a common theme or sentence throughout the book of Ezekiel is, the word of the Lord came to me. It's repeated a lot, I'm learning, in the book of Ezekiel. And what that tells me is God is not tired, does never get tired of speaking to us, right? It's just a question of whether we're going to listen to him or not. And, you know, primarily, although other ways, we got God's word to, to speak to us. Um, but along the lines of, of thanksgiving and uh, giving thanks, saving my soul, and making me whole, today's scripture reading, if you got your Bible, if you want to turn to it, is in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, starting with uh, verse 50. First Corinthians 15, 50. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable, perishable inher inherit the imperishable. That's a difference of having that personal relationship with Christ and not. Whether uh, we're imperishable or perishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in a twilight of my eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immorality. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, and that to me speaks of when we repent and ask God's forgiveness and ask Jesus Christ into our life, we're being clothed with imperishable. We have eternal life. And the mortal with immortality then saying that it is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Amen. Death has been swallowed up in victory. When we come to that personal relationship, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, 
The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory in our Lord Jesus Christ in that we have, we've overcome the flesh and blood and we have eternal life if we have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I will seek your face with all of my heart. 
I will seek your face with all of my mind. And I will seek your face with all of my strength. like stand for this next song that would be wonderful
it is growing with bird pains. And if you know anything about bird pains, you know they start out far apart. And then as they're getting close to the event, they get more frequent. And that's what's been happening in our earth. What do I have? We have all the calamities that we do on the earth right now. The earth is growing to be restored back to what it was when God originally created it. Today we're going to look at the second growing. There's three growings as I mentioned in this passage of Scripture. The second is the growing of believers. Now I have no doubt some of you are thinking, I grow all the time. But we'll look at that, what that means specifically. And then we're also going to look at the last part of this because it's part of this passage. We're going to look at our future heavenly bodies because it deals with this groan. According to Vine's Expository Dictionary in the New Testament, the word groan means an audible expression of anguish due to physical, emotional, or spiritual pain. These groanings express a condition that is painful, unsatisfying, and sorrowful. It is a cry for deliverance from a torturing experience. Now, it's not that your life down here should be full of torture. If someone is torturing you, get away from them. <laughs> Doug's going to leave. So let's, let's look at this passage. passage. Turn to Romans 8, if you would. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in front of you on the pew. Romans 8. We looked last week at the groaning of creation. And it talks about the groaning of creation is waiting for what? The redemption of believers. That's why it's groaning. And now we're going to look at the last, or the middle part of this groaning, which is Romans 8, 23-25. Romans 8, 23-25. And the Apostle Paul says, And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves. I don't know if you notice, he used the word ourselves how many times? Three. Three times. He says, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our body, for in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. The older I get, the more I am losing my patience with this whole body. The more I look forward to that heavenly body. That body that won't run out of energy, won't run out of juice, will be able to withstand anything that the world throws at me. Not only does the natural creation groan for deliverance from the destructive consequences of man's sin, but we ourselves, that is the believer's groan within their righteous nature. Your righteous nature. It is the redemption of believers that is central to God's eternal plan of redemption because believers, and believers only, as his children, redeemed and adopted into his heavenly family in response to their faith in God's beloved Son, Jesus Christ. We are the heirs of his eternal, glorious, and righteous kingdom. I look forward to that thousand-year millennium reign. I am personally just doing a personal study for my devotional time about the thousand-year millennium reign. Because, because I want to know more about it. And God talks about it a lot in his word. And so you don't miss the interpretation of this verse. Remember, the groaning of a believer has nothing to do with complaining. Nothing. We live in a world that's just full of complaints. 
Believers complain more in this day and age than ever before, I think. Because we're tired of this world. Every true believer agonizes at times over the appalling manifestations and consequences of sin in their own life, in the life of others, and even in the natural world. Because we have, as it says in this passage, the first fruits of the Spirit, we are spiritually sensitized to the corruption of sin in and around us. Because the Holy Spirit now dwells us, His work in us and through us is a type of spiritual first fruits. They are a foretaste of the glory that awaits us in heaven when our corrupted and mortal bodies are exchanged for the ones that are incorruptible and immortal. The Lord has given us complete victory over the dominion and bondage of sin. When we experience the Holy Spirit's power in us to turn from iniquity and to truly worship, serve, obey, and love God, we have a taste of our glorious future of a completed and perfect renewal he will work in us at the resurrection. Because every genuine believer is dwelt by the Holy Spirit. Every genuine believer with some degree manifests the fruit of the Spirit that Paul writes about in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. How many of you can say that? The fruit of the Spirit of our heart. Love, love, joy, peace, peace patience, patience, kind of good mistakes, just, just self-control. I learned, learned that through one of our Christian songs when we were doing the, the kids, kids program down there. We would sing that song, love, love. And, and I pretty soon got it down. Every, Every time we see him working his righteousness in and through us, we yearn all the more to be free from our remaining sin and spiritual weakness. Because our divinely bestowed sensitivity to sin we ourselves groan within ourselves over the dreadful curse of sin that is still manifested by our remaining humans. Paul grieved over the remnants of his humanness that clung to him like a rotten garment that he could not cast off. That reality brought him great spiritual frustration and anguish. Paul said, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of death? In another epistle, Paul reminds all believers of their same plight. He says, for indeed, while we are in this tent, this body, we groan, being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed. In order that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. What life? Eternal life. Eternal life. As, As believers, we therefore find ourselves waiting eagerly in anticipation of our adoption as the sons of the redemption of our body. The New Testament speaks of believers as those who are already adopted children of God, but whose adoption awaits the ultimate perfection. Just as there is never salvation that is not completed, neither is there divine adoption that is never completed. Every time he speaks about that, it's in the past tense. Did you realize that? It's already done. We just haven't realized it yet. Scripture teaches that a believer's salvation is secured by God the Father, by the Son, and in the body the Holy Spirit. If you believe you can lose your salvation, you have a powerless God. He's powerful enough to die on the cross and pay the penalty for your sins, but he's not powerful to finish the work that he began in your heart and life. Refer to God the Father, Paul assured the Corinthians, he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us in God who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts, and don't miss this, as a pledge. 
The Father not only grants salvation to those who trust in His Son, but also seals their salvation and gives the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. It's something that's going to happen. It says we're sealed until the day of redemption. That we're sealed past tense. Until the day of redemption. When does God unseal it? He has sealed you. He has taken out that letter, put a stamp and a seal on you, and it's from God, and He seals it to God. Although persevering faith is indispensable from salvation, Peter emphasizes by God the Father's own initiative and power, and that by that same power He sustains us towards the inheritance of the new birth, an inheritance that Peter describes as imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away. It is divinely reserved in heaven for each believer. Whoever belongs to God belongs to Him forever. Amen. Forever. God the Son also secures the believer's salvation. Paul assured the Corinthian church, which had more than a share of immature and disobedient believers, and he said this, that even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed to you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, waiting eagerly. Don't say it again. It says, waiting eagerly. The revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. A relationship to Christ not only had been confirmed when we were justified, but we would remain confirmed by the Lord Himself until our glorification at His return. Later in that epistle, the Apostle Paul reminded us that faithful as He who calls you, He will also bring it to pass. If you, if you believe you could lose your salvation, what is the purpose of God's discipline? There is no purpose. Or the purpose of just torturing you. One of the passages we first had down in Davenport called, he said he used to believe, before he started studying the book of Romans, that it was like God let a rope down from heaven and you were supposed to grab onto it and he'd wiggle you around and then he'd Oh, you let loose. That's, That's stuck, stuck in his mind, mind for years. Until someone discipled him and took him through the book of Romans. And what a transforming thing it was in his life. God changed him from a logger to a pastor. Believers should not be concerned about, or believers should be concerned about their sin in their lives. But, but not because they, they might sin themselves out of God's grace, which is impossible. But we need to realize that until we are glorified and fully liberated from the sinful body through the redemption of our body, we still have unredeemed bodies that make it very much possible for sin to harm us and to grieve our Lord. It is only the body, the mortal humanness of a believer, that is yet to be redeemed. The inner person is already a completely new creation, a partaker of God's nature and dwelt by God's Spirit. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. One, One theologian put it, put it this way, way and, and I like, like his quote. He says, because, because believers are already new creatures possessing the divine nature, their, their souls are fit for heaven and an eternal glory. They love God, hate sin, have holy longings for obedience to God's word, but while on earth they are kept in bondage by their mortal bodies, which are still corrupted by sin and its consequences. Christians are holy seeds, as it were, encased in an unholy shell, incarcerated in a prison of flesh, and subjected to its weakness and imperfections. 
We therefore eagerly await for an event that is divinely guaranteed, but is yet to transpire, the redemption of our body. I like that quote. It tells us about the struggle we have with our flesh. Hopefully you realize the old man and his sin nature is dead, though. It said in Romans that God took that and put it to death on the cross. He crucified it. And I know some of you are thinking, Pastor, why do I still sin then? Because you keep resurrecting that old man and bringing him back to life again. It can happen in a moment, can't it? You're driving down the road, someone pulls in front of you. I just, just resurrected that, that old man. And, and when, when I, I call him a certain word, word my, my wife, wife says, honey, you're a pastor. <laughs> Paul admonishes the believer to not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey. It's lust. It's lust. Because, because we're still, still capable of sinning, we should be continually on guard to resist, to resist and, and overcome sin, sin in, in the Spirit's power. I had a lady one time, time at a Bible study, study and she, she had just, just been struggling. struggling. And everybody could see her struggling. She, she just couldn't see herself struggling. And she, she came up after the Bible study, study and I wanted, I wanted to get to the food just like everybody else. And she, she said, Pastor, we need to read my diary so that you'll we'll understand what I'm dealing with. I didn't, I didn't want to read the diary. diary. That, that was a personal thing between her and the Lord. I read, I read the first couple pages of it. And I looked at her and I said, Mark, you're trying to overcome your sinfulness in your own power. And there's no power there. You need to give it all to God. Every aspect of it. I'd like, I'd like to stand before you today and say I saw her do that. But the, the last, last time I saw her, she was still struggling with it. Because, because of some dreadful event that happened when she was a child. No, no she didn't deserve it. But she needed to even give that over the Lord and then forgive that person. You know, you know in, in this passage, passage, it is encouragingly hopeful for Christians to realize that their, their falling into sin does not have a source in their, their deepest and in inner being, their, their new and holy nature in Christ. When, when they sin, they do so because of the desires and promptings of the flesh that is in their bodies, their remaining humanness, which they cannot escape until they go home to be with the Lord. I know, I know at funerals and at memorial services, we mourn over our loved ones. But, but if they, they know Christ, for them, it is, is a graduation. That, that flesh returns back, back to the dust, and they, they are absent from the body and in present with, with the Lord. As it's noted earlier, our souls, our souls are already fully redeemed in heaven. It is, it is hardly possible not to wonder what, what kind of resurrected and redeemed bodies the believers will have in heaven. But it is foolish to speculate about it apart from what Scripture teaches. It is. There is so much speculation that's happening today that I just don't like it. I've turned off some guys that I used to listen to who are speculating about all sorts of different things. They say, I think. God doesn't care what you think. He cares about what you obey. Anticipating such curiosity, though, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, some will say, how are you raised? How are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? And then he says something which I couldn't imagine. He said it, but he said, you fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives the body just as he wished. And to each of the seeds, a body 
of its, its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men and another flesh of beasts, and another flesh of birds, and another of fish. They are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly one is, and the glory of the earthly one is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. When I first read this passage, I sat there and thought, some people seem to think, or some believers seem to think, that we're all going to have the same glorious heavenly body. And so, and so walk, walk around, around and go, gee, gee I wonder who that, that person is. You need to go get your name tag. That's, That's not, not the way it's going to be. It says, it says we're going to recognize each other, but yet, yet we're going to have that glorious heavenly body. Paul's point, point in his first, first analogy is that, that seed bears no resemblance to the, the plant or tree into which it will grow. As far as size is concerned, some relatively large seeds produce small plants, whereas some smaller seeds produce larger trees. Many different kinds of seeds look much alike, and the total variety of seeds has yet to be calculated. If given a handful of seeds that were all different and they came from various parts of the world, not even the most experienced farmer much, much less, less the average, average person, person could, could identify, identify all of them. Not, not until it is sown and the resulting plant begins to mature and the kind of seed be accurately identified. The same principle applies in relation to our natural and spiritual bodies. We cannot possibly determine what our future spiritual bodies will be like by looking at our present physical body. We will, we will have, have to wait and see. Paul also points out the obvious fact that, that animate creatures vary widely in their appearance, nature, and that, without, without exception, like produces like. God gave it the genetic code of every living species in a distinct and in a unique way. No amount of attempt in a breeding can change the diet or if, or if you change the diet, can, can turn, turn a fish into, into a bird, or a horse into a dog. dog. And, and I have no doubt some crazy scientist is trying that. that. But, but they will they never be successful, because God is the creator. There is also a variety in heavenly bodies, and an immeasurably greater variety than people in Paul's day were aware of. The Apostle Paul's point in mentioning the animals and heavenly bodies seems to be that of calling attention to the vast magnitude and variation of God's creation to the inability of man even to come close to comprehending it. The Bible discloses very little about the nature of a believer's resurrected body, but Paul goes on to tell the Corinthians, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is its own perishable body. It is raised in an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. It was interesting this morning to me that Steve chose 1 Corinthians 15 to read the scripture reading of And him and I don't correlate. I don't sit there and go, okay, Steve, what are you preaching on? Or what are you reading this morning? I'm going to preach on that. God just puts things together the way he always does. During the period between his resurrection, between his resurrection and ascension, Jesus' body still bore the physical marks of his, his crucifixion, and he, he was, was able to eat. eat. He, he still, still looked, looked like himself, 
Yet, Yet even his closest disciples could not recognize him unless he allowed them to. He could, he could be, be touched and felt, yet he could also appear and disappear in an instant and could pass through closed doors. This is all in the Gospels. Although our redeemed bodies will in some way be like Christ, we will not know exactly what they will be like until we meet our Savior face to face. Paul's primary purpose in 1 Corinthians 15 and in Romans 8 is to emphasize that our resurrected bodies, regardless of their form, appearance, or capabilities, will be sinless, righteous, and immortal. He continues to explain that in hope we have been saved. Hope is inseparable from salvation. Our salvation was planned by God. It says, in the ages past, bestowed in the present, and is now characterized by hope for its future completion. The believer's hope is not based on wishful thinking or probability, but on the integrity of the clear promises of God. And as cited before, all that the Father gives me shall come to me, Jesus declared. Our hope is not that we might lose our salvation, but that by our Lord's own guarantee, we cannot and we will not lose it. As Jesus made clear in the parable of the wheat and tares and in the story of the fruitless branches out of John 15, there will always be some who bear the name of Christ who do not genuinely belong to him. We, we see this at the end of Matthew chapter 7. You have, have people who stand, stand before, before the Lord and go, I did I all these great things for you. And yet Christ will say, away from me, for I did not know you. And by the same token, there are true believers whose lives sometimes give little evidence of salvation. It is true, on the other hand, that the completion of our salvation is presently a hope and yet not a reality. Explaining the obvious, Paul states that truth, that hope that is seen is not hope. He's philosophizing here, you might say. For why does one also hope for what he sees? In other words, in this life, we cannot expect to experience the reality of our glorification, but only the hope for it. But since the believer's hope is based on God's promises, the completion of that salvation is more certain by far than anything else we can see. Paul continues, if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we await, we wait eagerly for it. For I am confident of this very thing, Paul assured the Thessalonian believers, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Salvation is completely God's work. If not, we would not have no need for a Savior or a Redeemer, and we could save ourselves. Peter admonishes believers, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace, that to, grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is for their Faithful, faithfully holding on to that hope that Paul commends the Thessalonians, assuring them that he, Silas, and Timothy were constantly bearing in mind their work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of, the, of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. 
In other words, our certainty of salvation does not rest on our choosing God, but God choosing us. And it goes on to say in Ephesians, even before the creation or foundation of the world. Now, to me, that is mind-boggling. Praise the Lord God for His perfected work in our salvation at the moment of our confessing our sins to Him by placing our faith in God's Son's work on the cross. Our place in heaven is reserved for all eternity. So He lives faithfully, and He tells us to live faithfully for the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's the way to live right side up in an upside down world. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this passage of scripture. And Lord, I know that every true believer groans, looks forward. And yes, sometimes I realize when it comes to patience, we don't have a lot of it. But yet in our inner being, we wait eagerly for that day. And Lord, as the Apostle John prayed, we pray that you would come back quickly. Lord, I thank you for all that you've done for us, and I thank you for your written word, that Lord, our salvation rests on your promises and upon you, not upon ourselves. And Lord, I thank you for the way you work in our hearts and our lives, even for the discipline you bring when I don't obey you. We thank you, Lord, that we can come and sing praises to you and worship you freely. And for all this, God's people said. Amen.
Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Bless you all. Have a great week, and grab a box on your way out. We're going to go to Margaret's car. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving.